Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. I'm Bill Dodd, and thanks for joining us on Market Journal today. We've got an informative program lined up for you, so let's dive into some of the trending topics in agriculture this week. And starting off with some local information, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln will be holding the Young, Beginner, and Small Farmer Symposium Monday, November 8th. This informative event is free to attend, however, registration is required, and time is of the essence if you'd like to attend. The Young Beginner and Small Farmer Symposium will feature a series of fast-paced panel discussions that will engage participants to co-create innovative solutions to challenges facing young, beginning, and small farming operations. When it comes to financing your operation, this is a unique opportunity you won't want to miss. Well, we have a great opportunity that the Farm Credit Administration, which is a national group that has jurisdiction over the different farm credit banks like Farm Credit Services of the Midlands, who cooperates with USDA and their young beginning and small farmer programs are, is coming to Lincoln and we're gonna have a symposium to talk about how do we finance young beginning and small farmers in Nebraska. Whether your farming operation is traditional or non-traditional, those in attendance can expect to learn a great deal on topics ranging from financing your operation to building better farms. Uh, a great discussion about how we finance different classes of young beginning and small farmers. We're gonna have a panel that are more traditional agriculture based. We're gonna have a group that's non-traditional. And then we're gonna have a group that is looking and talking about what's the future of farming in Nebraska and what do we anticipate for to be the different classes of young beginning or small farmers that may develop and need to figure out how they enter agriculture from a credit. Uh, how do they obtain operating money? How do they obtain capital for uh, facilities and or land resources? The farming industry is an ever-evolving entity. As time changes all things, it's no surprise that less traditional scenarios of family succession have become more common in the industry today. With that in mind, this symposium can help shed some light on succession planning through traditional and non-traditional practices. Because we have in traditional agriculture, we probably have that passing down of the farm or the ranch from you know the cow-calf uh, operator passes it on to his kids. As we get into non-traditional forms of agriculture, organic, small, uh, uh, direct marketing uh, types of operations, those might not have the uh, opportunity for succession from a family. They may be looking for succession from a neighbor or they may even be new entries into agriculture. So how do we help them find that uh, ability to enter from not only an experience and knowledge level, but have the capital to be able to enter agriculture? To recap, the event will be held on November 8th in the Great Plains Room of the Nebraska East Union, located at 1705 Arbor Drive here in Lincoln. The event will run from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. with registration and beverages at 8.30 a.m. The symposium is free to attend and includes a lunch at no expense to the attendees. Registration is required and the deadline to RSVP is November 1st. If you'd like to register or find more information on the symposium's lineup, we've taken the liberty of posting some helpful links on the Market Journal website. Next up, if you sprayed for thistles this past spring and summer, now is a great time to revisit those areas as there's likely some remaining or new growth that has occurred. When it comes to tackling thistles in your pasture, you'll want to be sure you're keeping these prickly plants under control. Beyond the fact that these weeds may be considered unsightly to many landowners, some varieties are actually required to be removed by law. Well, with uh, thistles, uh, yeah, just uh, the, the abundance of them that they can uh, really take over in your pastures and rangeland is that it's going to be First of all, it looks unsightly to a lot of people. Some of these, uh, like the musk thistle, are um, noxious weeds, I believe, and it's uh, required to control them if you do have them. And so it, it takes away from your pasture production of your for good, desirable forage. 
October and early November are prime time to get back into the fields and pastures to look for several types of biennial thistles that may have survived treatment or had any new growth that has begun to take hold. And if we're dealing with the, the biennial thistles, and that would be mostly the must thistle, but also there's some others such as the plumeless scotch and bull thistles, they are biennials. And so they take two growing seasons to complete their cycle. In the first season, they'll uh, begin from seed, of course, and then by fall here, they've grown to the stage where they're in what's called a rosette. So that's a flat circle of leaves on the, on the surface of the ground. And at that time, they're very susceptible to the herbicides that we will use, and that takes care of them very well. And of course, these thistles, they produce a lot of seeds when they get away from us and, you know, completely get through their full stage of development and flower and they produce a lot of fluffy seeds that move around in the wind and uh, they're, they're just very persistent pests. I did also want to mention that there is another uh, perennial thistle called Canada thistle that uh, we deal with as well in many areas. And this thistle has a uh, creeping underground rhizome. So it really grows in, in pretty uh, wide or wide spread patches. And fall is also another good time uh, to uh, work on that Canada thistle as well, because it oftentimes does have some uh, growth, new growth in the fall, or if that thistle had been mowed early this season, it will really um, respond and, and make a lot of fall growth as, as well. So a good time to spray that one also. When it comes to treating any problematic areas, there are a number of products you could enlist to tackle these tenacious thistles. When utilizing these types of applications, the use of repeated treatment is paramount to killing off root systems and completing the task at hand. Sure, there's a number of different herbicides that are quite effective on, on all of these thistles, things like uh, uh, Gunslinger, Milestone, Chaparral, Grassland, Stinger, um, Tordon 22K, all, all quite effective. And uh, particularly, we want to make sure the temperatures are fairly warm when we're applying these, uh, just because that does increase their effectiveness. And in the fall of the year, what we're really trying to accomplish is to get those herbicides taken in by the plant and taken down to the root system and, and kill that root system so that uh, effectiveness is much, much better than in the spring or summer. And it's just a good idea, idea, and it's really just a continuous battle against most of these thistles where we have to uh, every year almost do some type of control on them. They do have a large bank of seed in the soil that each year, even though we may have looked like we did a, a pretty good job of controlling the thistles, there's going to be some, some seed around left in that soil that will um, germinate and, and come up the following year. So it's just really important to be vigilant and it's almost needs to be an annual uh, practice of doing some scouting and, and looking at these different problem sites where you have had thistles in the past. If you'd like more information on controlling thistle and other fall considerations, you can visit cropwatch.unl.edu. We've also taken the liberty of posting some helpful links on the Market Journal website. Moving on to markets now, and according to our next guest, the October 22nd Catalan feed report, which showed September placement at 97% of last year, was slightly friendly for the cattle industry. Joining me now to discuss that and more is Oklahoma State University Livestock Marketing Specialist, Daryl Peel. Daryl, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today. You bet, happy to be here. Now let's get things started by getting your take on the recent Catalan feed report. Yeah, this report, uh, you know, the placements did come in a little bit uh, smaller than expected uh, in this October Catalan feed report. So, um, you know, I think that's that's a, a little bit friendly uh, in terms of, of the overall numbers. Um, you know, the on feed total for October 1st was down uh, nearly 2% uh, year over year. And this is the fourth month in a row of declining uh, feedlot inventories compared to last year. So we are making some progress in pulling these feedlot inventories down. And Daryl, when you're examining these placement numbers, what does that tell you about where producers stand so far this fall? Well, you know, it's been a, it's been a long, slow grind this summer to try to get uh, a little bit improved situation, if you will, in, in the fed cattle market. And I think when you look at the weight distribution in uh, not only in this last report, but really the, the several months prior to that, you start to see why it's been kind of a slow grind to make some progress here. 
we've had uh, you know we've had a lot of heavyweight placements. We've kind of kept the front end, the uh, feedlot sort of front loaded uh, this year, and, and we're still working through that. And so we've had just lots of uh, ready cattle uh, up against uh, you know the the ability to process those cattle. Now I've heard you comment that we may be getting close to flipping the leverage between producers and packers. However, it appears we're seeing a tight race between the number of cattle available and the total amount of capacity for packer labor. Can I get your thoughts on that? Yeah, you bet. You know, it has been a, a, a real challenge this year with the, uh, the packing capacity constraints. And of course, the longer the year's gone on, we relied so much early in the year on uh, Saturday kills and so on to, to, to maintain that. And that's been hard to do as we get through the year. So we've kind of got uh, the capacity constraints staying pretty tight at the same time that we're just slowly making some progress on the, on the fed cattle number side. And so I don't think we're quite there yet. These, these numbers would suggest to me that we've still got a little ways to go, but I think uh, you know, we're, we're getting closer. And, and as we finish out uh, this year, probably uh, by the time we get into December, I think we'll see uh, this thing really start to change uh, tone a little bit. Now, Daryl, I've been seeing a lot of reports lately on cattle producers taking matters of packing into their own hands with proposed independent packing plants. How far do you see this kind of strategy going? Could this be the new normal? And what, how could a venture like this truly impact the meatpacking industry as a whole? Well, you know, obviously we've been through an awful lot of stress the last couple of years, and, and it's really capitalized on or sort of manifested itself by the fact that the, the overall packing industry downsized over the last 20 years. And then as we've reached cyclically uh, peak numbers, we've bumped up against that, and that's caused some real uh, real strain in the industry. So, uh, you know, these, these initiatives now to add some packing capacity uh, from these, uh, you know, producer-driven, uh, mid-sized kind of things is going to help a little bit if, if we, if we're able to, to, to follow through on those and get those in line. Uh, I, you know, I don't know that it's a major change in the overall situation. And of course, we've got to recognize that we are now actually liquidating cattle numbers. So we're going to see the numbers fall a little bit in, in the coming years. But, uh, you know, it's all part of, uh, you know, there, there's certainly a need for some additional infrastructure investment in the cattle industry uh, as we go forward. So, you know, this could definitely be part of that. And speaking of future numbers, looking at the long term here, how has the recent drought endured by producers around the United States impacted our calving cycle? Do these latest cattle on feed numbers shine any sort of light on where beef cow numbers will stand come January? You know, we've been watching the drought all year in terms of what it might be uh, doing to our longer term trajectory for cattle numbers. Uh, obviously, we've been watching cow slaughter in terms of uh, indications for herd liquidation, and it certainly appears that we have that. This latest cattle on feed report was also a quarterly report, and we get a breakdown of steers and heifers on feed. And interestingly enough, the October 1 uh, heifers on feed actually ticked back up just a little bit from last year. It was down in July, the steer numbers were down in July and in October, but the fact that these heifer numbers are up a little bit uh, in this October report may be an indication that some of those heifers that were originally intended to be replacement heifers for the breeding herd have been uh, redirected now into the feedlots. And so that's probably one more reason why it's taken a little longer to sort of pull these feedlot numbers down. And as we're currently sitting in the fourth quarter of the 2021 fiscal year, is there any marketing or risk management strategies that producers should start to consider? Well, obviously we've been through a tremendous amount of volatility and I don't know that that's completely over at this point. So there's always a reason for producers to, to think about uh, risk management. I do think in general, we're moving into perhaps a, a little bit more relative stability. That is to say, you know, with the, in, the industry kind of focusing on its uh, sort of normal dynamics as opposed to some of these external shocks unless something else jumps up. So, uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, producers I think can, can sort of think about what their longer term goals are here, um, you know, in terms of their own operations. And, and, and start to you know, kind of come back to those plans and, and move forward. And, and, and part of that consideration certainly should be uh, you know, where they need to be in terms of managing risk. All right, I think that's gonna wrap it up for us today. Daryl, thank you so much for joining us this week. You bet, happy to be here. Next week, we'll be joined by Trados's Doug Simon. If you have a question you'd like for me to ask, you can contact us via email or get in touch on social media, and I'll be sure to pass that question along. Up next, late fall and early winter are good times for landowners to work at clearing out invasive red cedar trees from grazing lands. 
but landowners who mechanically clear trees and brush often struggle with what to do with the slash of trees and limbs left behind. Mulching the slash is often the cleanest way to diminish the brush, but slash can also be piled for burning later on. You can learn more about what to do with cleared trees and limbs in the October issue of Nebraska Farmer. And it's time again to get our weekly check on the weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al, temperatures have begun to dip a bit more this week. What can we expect as we head into November? Well, Bill, we certainly got the cold air come in during the middle of the week. And in fact, it wasn't that nice as we got into the last weekend with the first system to come through. Decent precipitation across eastern Nebraska, in fact, enough to make our monthly totals go from below normal to above normal. And even if we stay dry the remainder of these next couple of days, it's going to have no bearing. We're going to be above normal across much of eastern Nebraska with these recent precipitation events. Now, as we go forward in time, this cold air that come in during the middle of the week is just a prelude to some of the cold that we're going to be dealing with next week. We're going to stay well above normal across most of the central United States, and then that air will start to shift as we get late in next week toward the east. So let's take a look at the upper air models and see what we may have in store as we go to this seven-day period. And the first thing I'll draw your attention to, a big trough toward north, and we're going to finally tap this as we go through the week, and this is going to start to sag toward the south. If this was December, January, February, we'd be calling this an Alberta Clipper. So we do have some very cold and somewhat dry air moving toward the south. Enjoy today. For most of the state, this might be the last time we see 60s for at least another week to maybe even until next spring. It just depends on how the conditions go. But this trough will start to sag in earnest as we go through to into tomorrow. We'll see high pressure pushing rapidly behind it. The surface front will start to lay across the southern part of the state. We'll start to see some precipitation breaking out across the panhandle and that will fill in as we go through the day and in through the early part of Monday as we get another piece of energy rotating around this trough to help generate some lift in the southwest. So we finally might be able to get some measurable precipitation in the southwest. Unfortunately, it may come in the area of at least a little bit of snow. And depending on when this precipitation breaks out, we may see some accumulations probably in the light range one to two inches. By Tuesday, cold air starts to shift toward the east and the most of the energy with that trough shifts toward the east. We'll be just left with the flow coming out of the north and reinforcing areas of high pressure coming in to keep the temperatures consistently in the 40s for highs across the state. By Wednesday we start to see the broadening of this trough as the primary energy moves up into the northeastern United States. We're still on the back side here in the central plains so that funneling of cool air from Canada will continue. It'll sag all the way down towards central Texas, and then we turn our attention to the Pacific Northwest with a trough that's going to dig down to the coastal region and then move into the southwest on Thursday. We'll start to see low pressure developing in southern portions of Nevada and in the Texas Panhandle. That will start to help generate some precipitation across the western United States. And then as the system starts to open up on Friday, we'll start to see more of a response in the central Great Basin region for precipitation as that Gulf moisture gets wrapped around this system. And then we'll have to watch this system as we go into this weekend to see whether it stays to the south of us or starts coming up impacting southern Nebraska. The 8 to 14 day forecast from next Thursday to the following Tuesday is indicating that that cold air with that low pressure system will move toward the southeast. A lot of cloud cover, so we'll stay below normal. Above normal temperatures in the southwest, but there is another system coming in on the heels of this system coming in next weekend that looks like it is going to take a movement toward the central Rockies and start impacting our weather here in the central plains as we get around the middle of the month. So buyer beware, there is a possibility at this time of the year we we'll get enough cold air that we should see some accumulating snowfall with that system at mid-month. Borderline is, enjoy this day today. Things turn terribly cold as we go through the majority of next week. Thanks, Al. Finally today, once sorghum has experienced freezing temperatures, it produces a cyanide compound within the plant itself. With freezing conditions well on their way and hints of winter already touching parts of Nebraska, beef producers grazing plants in the sorghum family should be considering how to safely graze that resource. This week, we spoke with Extension educator Ben Beckman to get some advice on doing just that. Many varieties of sorghum are utilized by producers as forage, but this late in the year, sorghum varieties need to be utilized properly as frost can trigger sorghum plants to produce a cyanide compound that could negatively impact your cattle's well-being. So uh, this time of year, uh, especially when we're dealing with any of our forage species, so um, that can be you know, milo and, and grain sorghum, um, 
forage sorghums, uh, anything to uh, Johnson grasses in the, the sorghum family, um, as Piper sedan grasses is, is another forage or a, a sorghum species. Um, all of these sorghum families have a compound in them called durin, and um, this compound can break down when we have a frost event or um, basically when the, the cell walls in that plant get damaged and it creates a compound that we know as prussic acid. Uh, prussic acid is a cyanide compound, so if our animals ingest it, we've got some issues. Um, so this time of year, especially when we've got frosts coming through and they're regularly damaging those plants, we really need to be careful about um, how we let those animals graze them, um, you know, especially when we've got heavy frost damage or we've got um, these sorghum species that might have had some stress earlier in the year where these compounds have been built up um, to a point that they're really going to cause some concerns for us. Once ingested by cattle, the negative impact of prussic acid toxicity will be quickly noticeable. Once those negative side effects have taken hold, there's little that can be done to mitigate or deter those symptoms. Prussic acid is, uh, since it's a, a cyanide compound, again, it's going to be really fast acting. Um, so honestly, if, if you see um, issues with prussic acid, uh, we're basically what it's doing is it's um, making the oxygen um, availability uh, in the blood, it interferes with the hemocellulose, and so that, that oxygen is unable to bind to your red blood cells, and the animal is, is basically suffocating um, when we get cyanide poisoning with this, or, or prussic acid poisoning. So we're gonna see signs like staggering, um, shortness of breath, um, you know, blue mucous membranes, things like that, that we'd associate with like someone drowning or, or something like that, basically. Um, and if we have those symptoms, um, chances are it's probably gonna progress pretty quickly and, and there's not a whole lot that we can do on the back end to, to prevent something once we see those signs. Um, if we do see those signs in any animals, uh, the first thing and, and the, the thing we want to do right away is pull all the other animals off right away so they're not consuming anything else, um, you know, so we don't have more train wrecks. Um, but once we notice those signs, um, there's not a whole lot we can do. So this is really something that we need to manage for on the front end um, and prevent any problems ahead of time, um, not really something that we can treat once we notice that we've got an issue. Once a frost has occurred, it's highly recommended to pull your herd off of any sorghum until prussic acid that is developed in the plant has had a chance to dissipate. However, you'll still need to keep track of any new growth and future frost events. And as soon as we have a frost where tissue is damaged in that plant, um, our recommendation is to pull those animals off for at least five days. Um, now, the nice thing about prussic acid compared to something like nitrates is that prussic acid will turn into a gas, it'll volatilize out, and it'll dissipate. And so once we uh, kind of reach that five-day window, most of that you know, prussic acid has gassed off and, and we can turn animals back out again. Um, the difficult thing with this, though, is that um, Prussic acid is, is usually found in new shoots um, in higher concentrations. Um, so that's why uh, even when we started, you know, looking at grazing or, or utilizing some of these sorghum species, you'll often see, you know, height requirements before we can turn animals out to graze. And that's to, again, prevent uh, prussic acid poisoning. Um, and so when we've got these frost events come in, uh, we can have new shoots and new suckers develop, and those are going to have those high concentrations again. So we need to, to be concerned about that and keep an eye on that um, as well. Um, typically we want any new shoots for like our um, Sudan grasses because they naturally have a little bit lower concentrations of prussic acid. Uh, we want those to be at, at around 18 inches in height, 15 to 18 inches before we can really safely graze those if they're in a large abundance across the field. Uh, for our forage sorghum species, those are going to be um, have higher concentrations of prussic acid just naturally. And so we want those to be um, anywhere from 18 to 24 inches in height. And so those new shoots and new suckers, if they're coming out the side of the plant, sometimes that can be a little bit hard to, you actually have to go out there and, and do some measuring and looking um, in order to get a really good grasp of how they're developing. Um, and, and again, because we get those frost events, sometimes that can trigger more shoots, more suckering um, coming off if the whole plant hasn't been killed. Another thing that we have to keep into consideration is every time a new part of the plant gets this frost damage on it, we're basically resetting that five-day timer. Um, so maybe we had a frost on Monday, we waited three days and we get another frost on Wednesday, we got to set that timer again. And so later on in the season here, until that entire plant's actually been killed, um, it can be really difficult to, to manage grazing on some of these um, sorghum species. 
When it comes to other means of prussic acid mitigation, there are a few options and alternative forage sources that can be utilized by producers that will significantly reduce the risk of any prussic acid exposure. We can consider other options. Uh, again, since this uh, prussic acid is going to dissipate out, uh, if we can hay that, you know, maybe put it up in a windrow and, and do some windrow grazing. Now, this time of year, uh, that's going to be a little bit more difficult because uh, we don't have the heat, we don't have the, the sun intensity to dry out that windrow like we would earlier in the year. Um, so it can get a little bit dicey, but if we knock that down, um, you know, our, our prussic acid is going to dissipate out and we can utilize some window grazing techniques. Um, if we want to ensile it, that's another option that we can have and that ensiling process is, is going to get rid of the, the prussic acid as well. Um, and I guess an, another thing that um, we can always consider next year, um, it doesn't really help us out much this year, but if we do know that we want to be grazing something in the fall and we don't want to be worrying about prussic acid and, and the grazing management that comes with it, um, there are some other options that we can consider. You know, a, an early planting of, of oats in a brassica um, can have some really great late fall growth and, and um, utilization from a, a forage grazing standpoint. Um, we can, you know, plant some things like foxtail and pearl millet. Those species um, don't have the prussic acid concerns that we have in our sorghums, um, and so we can get similar production, um, maybe not quite as much as a forage sorghum, um, but without that, that risk of prussic acid. So that's something that if we know we're gonna be grazing in the future in the fall um, and we don't wanna deal with it, um, just making those selections sometimes can um, really help us out as well. Thanks again to Ben for taking the time to talk with us this week. If you'd like more information on prussic acid toxicity and tips on safely grazing sorghums, you can follow Ben on Twitter at Big Red Beef Talk. Beyond that, interviews with the authors of Beef Watch newsletter articles are also accessible at go.unl.edu forward slash podcast. We've also posted Ben's most recent article on safely grazing frosted sorghums on the Market Journal website. And that's going to wrap up this week's show. Remember, if you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. Next week, we'll be joined by Tradeos' Doug Simon for a check on the markets. Plus, we'll examine how testing forage can boost your cattle's nutrient intake as well as save you some money in the long run. We'll hope to see you right back here next week. Till then, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.